So we are in Joshua chapter 8. The title of the message, Back on Your Feet. We know that the Bible tells us in Proverbs 24, 16, for a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. And so the wicked doesn't have the promise that the righteous have. So we fall, we get back up because of the promise and the power uh, of the Lord in our lives. And so, and so um, I'd like to point out First, kind of spinning uh, or springboarding off of the beginning of chapter 7, where you remember after God's people had a great victory over Jericho, recorded in chapter 6, in chapter 7 begins, but, but, and... Chapter 7 revealed that although God gave them victory over their enemies, there was those who did not, or those that did what they wanted to do. And they did, what they did was against God, God's clear command. And so it brought sin into the camp, into the house of God's people. So God would not let them move on as a successful army unless sin at the sin at hand was dealt with. And so and so uh, and so we see and I would like to mention kind of on a side side note is that you know the sin that that was they were dealing with God wouldn't just let them sweep it under the carpet and and the sin was a little bit more far reaching than that in the sense that you know as i mentioned last week many of Achan's family was also destroyed in the judgment it says even his sons and his daughters we saw that in in 724 um let's see here 724 where it says and then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. And then there, there was the judgment against them. You know, uh, his wife isn't listed there. And I think that it's important to kind of make note here that there was an indication that there was some sort of a joint effort uh, on their part. You, you know, you think, you think sons and daughters, you, you think, you know, don't think infants and toddlers, think grown sons and daughters. And uh, like, like all my kids are grown. <laughs> they're my sons and my daughters, and they're all, they're all adults. And, and the thing is, um, is, you know, there's an accountability um, factor. But the reason I bring this up is, you know, you notice, of course, his wife is not included in that list uh, of those judged. But uh, because God's judgment is always righteous. This is the reason I mention this is because we find in Deuteronomy 24 as an example in verse 16 where it says, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers, a person shall be put to death for his own sin. And so even though we don't have the full picture, we do have, we do know that about God's judgment because judgment will be individual for the individual and it will also be personal. And only God knows, um, you know, his, his God. God's the one who knows the heart. He's the one that, that uh, that that meets out perfect uh, judgment, and so in his judgment, also keep keep in mind there's there's that um, that age of accountability that is factored in uh, that we wouldn't really know or understand, and so um, 
And so God being outside of time, you know, he's unlimited in his perspective, unrestricted in his judgment, his ability to do so, to know the heart of every man, every woman, and every child, past, present, and future. Nothing unknown or not considered concerning the final judgment. And so this is something that we cannot comprehend or calculate in any way because it's completely and totally for God. And so when we read these things, I think not having that in mind, uh, it may be a misrepresentation of the character of God when you pass over things like this. And I didn't mention it last week. I thought it was important to mention. Um, and, so, and so here, um, you know, this, uh, this records the capital punishment directed by God. So... This would once again be a reminder that there was severe consequences to purposely disobey God's command. And we know that God doesn't change. And so when you consider the New Testament and the New Covenant, if there's not a new God. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed. No shadow of turning with God. And so when you read... Even in uh, the New Testament, when you read in Acts chapter 5, you can read it later concerning Ananias and Sapphira, remember? It says that they lied to the Holy Spirit, and God slew them on the spot. Uh, I think that that, that, would, that would maybe be making a statement to the church that God still severely judges sin, and, and mostly not in those terms. But the statement was made early on, and the whole church all of a sudden had a wake-up call to the severity of sin. And so God doesn't change. And so, and so now the sin was dealt with, and you see in, in verse 1 of chapter 8, it says, Now the Lord said, to Joshua make note and so for Joshua this was kind of starting over it's like okay let's get started again okay a new beginning here sin was dealt with so there is going to be a new startup once again let's get going and that's what the Lord does you know that's the character of God new beginnings the Lord gives us uh, new beginnings. This is God's nature when dealing with us who are perpetual sinners. God gives us, uh, you know, we're perpetual sinners by nature. And, and God, by his nature, gives us fresh starts and new beginnings over and over again. Can it, you know, is, is it just me or do you guys know about that? <laughs> and I say that just making a joke, but... As we see here in verse 1, in the word the Lord spoke to Joshua that what he experienced was really a setback because in there, the Lord says to Joshua, do not be afraid or dismayed. Well, he had said that to Joshua back in chapter 1 when he was flustered, in a sense, taking over for Moses and given this responsibility. He said the same thing to Joshua in Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So he's repeating to Joshua the very word that he had already given to Joshua. So Joshua was delayed in this encounter, which, by the way, could have been different if Joshua would have, would have been seeking the Lord and praying and so forth. But Joshua now, think of the human element here. Joshua, a leader at this point, and most likely would have asked a question, am I even called? You know, that's the human response because now he's afraid and he's dismayed. 
because the Lord reminded them not to be. But if I was truly anointed to lead, would I do something so stupid? That would be another human response. Um, ask me how I know. <laughs> so a lot of things are very practical, you know, for our lives. But I remember, you know, times ending up in that exact place over and over again. And then I read this and I get encouraged. But I remember the first time I taught the Bible in a, a Sunday night study that um, the pastor asked me if I would teach. And, you know, I was sick for a week thinking that I, I was going to teach. And so I taught. And then afterwards, Alandrina says, hey, do you know you made a mistake? And I go, what are you talking about? Well, you, you, made, you made a statement that, you know, can any man add to his... His stature, I think, it was the out of Matthew six or something, and I said, um, and I said, add to his height. I think is what it was. She said, no, that meant to his years. And I went, no, it doesn't. So I went, and got all my books out, started looking, and I went. When I found out she was right, I said, see, I'm not called to teach. I am not called to teach, and this is proof of it. And she said, are you kidding me? And she laughed at me. She said, I've heard Pastor Chuck make mistakes. I've heard Greg Laurie. You know, she threw out all the big names. I've heard them make mistakes. And then I went, uh, it didn't encourage me uh, <laughs> at all. <laughs> but what I learned was a big part of spiritual maturity is knowing that you will fail. And when you do, you do what's right in the Lord in response, and you keep moving forward. And so uh, you get knocked down, and you're fearful, and you lose confidence like Joshua did. You need to get up, do what's right in the Lord, and get moving. But I would say that although I say that, that this is all part of being human and our sin nature. And, and can I even go a little bit further and say it's unavoidable? It will happen. You will do all, all the mistakes even though you read it for yourselves and you see Joshua do it and you see whoever else do it. Peter, you'll, you'll say, oh, I'm glad that I read that and then you'll turn around and do the same thing because it's the human nature, but we're encouraged because we see God's response to them. And so we see God's response. And, and also I'd like to bring the Apostle Paul um, up for an example because, because he realized that early on being called to be an apostle, he said in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, for I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God... I am what I am. In other words, I'm stepping up. Not that I'm worthy or qualified or did, did everything right, but I'm stepping up. Why? I am what I am. Why? Because of Jesus. That's the reason. And his grace toward me was, without, <clears throat> was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So he fully embraced the grace of God and was able to move forward despite himself. I am what I am. What does that mean? I am what I am. In other words, I've been set free from my sin, delivered from darkness. I've been made alive spiritually. I've been promised everlasting life. I've been empowered by the Spirit. And so when we sin, not if we sin, but when we sin, then we repent and are restored. And so important to realize when we repent, and when we are restored, not becoming in the process any less than who we are in Christ all along. That's huge. In the process, you're a sinner, and in your, in your repenting and in your restoration, never in the process do you ever become anything less than you are in Christ all along. And so you're able to get up, because if my security in Christ had to do with my daily performance, I would be in trouble. And, what would, and, and never does your relationship in Christ fluctuate. 
You gotta remember that. Rather, my security and confidence rest solely and completely on Jesus Christ and him alone and the finished work that he accomplished. Important to know. Why? Because you're gonna get knocked down. And so the battle continues. And so this principle we see also uh, in Abraham. If you remember, when God called Abraham, uh, God gave him specific instructions. But what did he do? He compromised those specific instructions that God gave him early on. And instead of he followed his earthly father's counsel, he didn't follow the counsel of his heavenly father in the process. We know that. And we see that in Genesis eleven thirty one, where it tells us, And Terah took his son Abraham and his grandson Lot to the son of, to the, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abraham's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. So that wasn't God's plan for, that was Terah's plan. But we know that the first word that came to Abraham was given to us by Stephen in his account in Acts 7 where it says, and he said, brethren and fathers, he's ministering, giving testimony. Listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. So what had happened was, is, and it's interesting because Terah, his father's name means delay. Haran, where they ended up for 10 years of a delay, means parched. And so it wasn't until Terah died that God spoke again to Abraham, just like he's speaking it again to Joshua. But the thing is, is this is what he said to Abraham after his dad died. Now, once again, now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. Exactly the same words. And then Abraham moved and was obedient to the Lord. And his dad was removed out of the picture. So we see the same thing here. Now the Lord said to Joshua. And we're going to do this. This is another go around. Let's do this. Let's learn. Okay. So like with Joshua, needed repeating. Can I relate? Absolutely. But it tells us the promises of God are yes and amen. Yes, amen. God fulfills his promise. Uh, tells us 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. So the problem is never the promises, but we can forget what they are. That's the problem. The problem is never the promises of God, but the fact that we forget what they are. But God is faithful to remind us. And sometimes there's, there's delays. Sometimes there's course of action that aren't necessary. But then we're reminded. And then God gives us the same word. And then eventually we start <clears throat> being where he wants us. But he's so patient. And Joshua was a, was a mighty man of God. A mighty man of valor. In verse 1 again, Joshua's commanded by the Lord in, in these next things, marching orders. You know, he says, do not be afraid nor be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise. Go to Ai. See, I have given it into your hand, the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. And so after these things, Marching orders are given to Joshua once again, not Joshua, take a year off, you know, to find yourself, you know, to get settled down. No, he blew it, get over it in the Lord and get back to it. That's the idea. 
Um, and so God has uh, given you promised victory, He's given us promised victory, and so we're to move, to move out. And you notice it says there in verse 1, take all the people of war with you and arise. It says, go up to A- AIC, he says, I have given it to you. See, notice, and you think, well, see by what means? Well, by faith. Because he hadn't seen it yet, but that's how we move. By faith. Abraham, the father of faith, went to a place that God was going to show him. Joshua is going to move against Ai because, you see, I've delivered it into your hands. And um, we know from Hebrews 11.1 what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen physically. But we see through the eyes of faith. And so, and so we see that being used there. And, uh, now be confident, Joshua. Get going is the idea. And um, with no more fear, no more being dismayed. Joshua, dismayed means shattered, broken, scared, terrified, all the above. Once again, the human element. And so those things would be apart from being confident, apart, of, apart from hope, apart from faith and then in verse 2 and you shall do to ai and its king as you did to jericho and its king so god gives a visual an object lesson and i that that always works for me i love object lessons only it's spoil it's cattle you shall take as booty for yourselves lay an ambush for the city behind it so a little bit different here in this battle first of all how much more foolish does the sin of Achan seem when it says here now they get to take the booty when before he was disobedience to God and he took the booty when God says no this is all to be God's and so the other thing is is how much more foolish does our sin look in the light of eternity when we're promised that plus the fact the fellowship here with the lord taking booty now something to make note of taking booty was a sin was not a sin in and of itself as you see here but what was the sin it was doing going against god's clear command not taking the booty Uh, that in itself is not the sin and then god says okay so it's going to be different here uh it's going to be an ambush so here's the plan. It's not a frontal attack, but it's a sneak attack. It's going to be, they're going to be stealth. And so God doesn't give Joshua any more than that, but God has been directing Joshua as a leader. So the details, if he happened to tell him directly, that's not recorded here, but more than likely, just the fact to lay, to lay out an ambush would have been, you know, uh, a strategy of war so joshua arose and all the people of war to go up against ai and joshua chose thirty thousand mighty men of valor and sent them away by night thirty thousand compared to the suggestion of two or three thousand in the last you know in uh, chapter six where the council was and two or three thousand thirty thousand Ten times the men, <laughs> using his full resources, right? But this is interesting because although God promised the victory, you got the victory, he's delivered, but Joshua, 30,000, you know, they're not doing it. They're not, the victory is not going to come because he's sending 30,000. The victory is going to become because the promise has been given. But yet Joshua sends 30,000 uh, at night in an ambush so they're going to be setting up and uh, and he commanded them saying behold you shall lie in ambush against the city behind the city do not go very far from the city but all of you be ready 
So in the hill country, they, they're, they're gonna head mostly west, but a little bit north, about 12 miles out from Jericho is where AI was. So they're probably gonna make some sort of sweep, maybe using the land so they can't be seen and then end up um, you know, being near AI and re getting ready. So they're using night besides. They're, they're not gonna have, they don't have spotlights or any way of really seeing them. They'd be quiet and moving out. Getting close, you know, near, near the, the city. And, um, and then I and all the people who are with me will approach the city and it will come about when they come out against us as at the first that we shall flee before them. And so you can see the setup to draw them out uh, against them for they will come out after us to, uh, for they will come out after us till we have drawn from them from the city, for they will say they are fleeing before us as at the first, therefore we will flee before them. Then you shall rise from the ambush and seize the city, for the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand, and it will be when you have taken the city that you shall set the city on fire According to the commandment of the Lord, you shall do, uh, the, the Lord you shall do, see I have commanded you. So interesting, uh, because what we're going to see developed here is that the bigger majority of men will be sent out initially, and then Joshua is going to come out with a smaller band, but a big enough band also to hide 5,000, and then he's going to approach to where he could be seen by AI in a smaller group, which then they're going to flee and draw them out of the city uh, as they had happened uh, the first time. And so I find that interesting, fleeing before us as at the first, because here they're, they're using, you, as you will, their past sin and their error and their fault to an advantage they're recreating the thing that went south on them before that was not good. And I thought about that a little bit, and I thought that's a key factor to testimony, is oftentimes what happens is, is that you use the past painful situations to our advantage to minister to others and to have victory because of what we experienced. We wouldn't want to do it again, but hey, we're gonna, we learned. And so, um, and so the previous conditions, they're using that to their advantage for the ambush, the trap that's set. They're gonna pull them all out of that place. And then if you see there again in verse eight, I like that because, well, they're gonna set this city on fire, but you know it's gonna be after they take out the booty there's going to be that taking away of all the things that they're going to keep, and then they'll burn uh, the city. Uh, and then it says what? According to the commandment of the Lord, you shall do. But then it says, Joshua said, see, I have commanded you. So it's according to the commandment of the Lord, but Joshua says, see, I've commanded you. And that's no different than when we give God's word to someone. You give God's word to something that somebody, uh, you just say, yeah, this ain't, this ain't my words. This is the word of the Lord. And so, you know, when we do that, then it has authority and the Holy Spirit backs it up. Now, if it was just my word, in my opinion, so what? But when it's God's word, that means a lot. And uh, those who hear it best uh, take heed to the word of the Lord. And so then we move on here. So Joshua, verse 9, therefore sent them out, and they went to, to lie in ambush and stay between Bethel and Ai on the west side of Ai. 
But Joshua lodged that night among the people, so he's kind of going to be in the second wave after all the guys get set. Then Joshua rose up early in the morning and mustered the people and went up, and he, uh, he and the elders of Israel before the people of Ai and all the people of war who were with him went up and drew near, and they came before the city and camped on the north side of Ai. Uh, now a valley lay between them and Ai, so he took ab about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the city. So when they made their approach, the 5,000 weren't seen. The 5,000 were put in for ambush. There was a valley that would, they would be drawn out into. When they were finally seen, they were seen as just a small representation that would cause Ai then to open the city gates and head out after them. So that's how it was laid out. But you notice that they took the offensive and they took the fight to them. They weren't passive, but aggressively went out after the enemy. When I read that, I thought of David. When everybody else was afraid of the enemy, and then here was David, filled with the spirit, a shepherd boy who heard from God and knew his wonders and his power and already had victory over a bear, victory over a lion and protecting the sheep and had a, a heart after God. And so when he came up against the giant, the record reads like this in 1 Samuel 17 when it says then, all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone. So he, he didn't even lock and load yet. He just still had his stone in the bag. And he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran, you notice he ran again and stood over the Philistine took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him. So it almost seems as if, you know, he was still alive there, but he killed him by cutting his head off with it. And then when, and, and when the Philistines saw, that their, Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And so again, you see a mighty warrior taking the fight to them, a, a, not not sheepishly, but ran towards this giant because he was empowered by the Lord. And so we see that, we see that, uh, that offensive here. And, um, and then we see the ambush now is in place. And when they had set the people, all the, the army that was on the north of the city, and so as they approached Ai, they would have moved north and been hidden, uh, close to the city, but not seen. And its rear guard on the west of the city, uh, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley, so kind of under the cover of darkness. Now it happened when the king of Ai saw it, so this smaller number, that the men of the city hurried and rose early and went out against Israel to battle, he and all his people, and at and an appointed place before the plain. But he did not know that there was an ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel uh, made as if they were beaten before them and fled by the way of the wilderness. So all the people who were in Ai were called together to pursue them, and they pursued Joshua and were drawn away from the city. And there was not a man left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out against Israel. So they left the city open and pursued Israel. And so we see God's um, um, 
blessing upon their plan. It was it worked out seamless, you know, and uh, using night uh, also to set this thing all up. That uh, that under the cover of darkness, but these were children of the light under the cover of darkness, you know. Uh, my, my son Anthony, he told me when he was on special forces, they would go against the enemy at night because they had all the advantage. They had superior high-tech night vision. And I remember what he said to me, hey, Dad, it wasn't even fair. He said, these guys would be hiding around bushes and we just see them as clear as if it was daytime. And they thought they were hidden with, the, with this this, this modern technology that they had. And he says, so they would go in at night and they had the full advantage. And so we see here uh, Joshua using night to an advantage. And so with, you know, of course, God's blessing. Then, then the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out the spear that is in your hand toward Ai, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that was in his hand toward the city, kind of like when Moses used to hold the staff up. So that those in ambush arose quickly out of their place. They ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand. That was a signal. They entered the city and took it and hurried to set the city on fire. And when the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended to heaven, so they, they had no power to flee this way or that, or that way, and the people who had fled to the wilderness turned back on the pursuers. So now Joshua's team turned around. The 5,000 that would be right there would have come in on, on the men there. <clears throat> now when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. Then the others came out of the city against them, so they were caught in the midst of, of uh, Israel, uh, some on this side and some on that side, and they struck them down so that they let none of them remain or escape. But the king of Ai, they took alive and brought him to Joshua, and it came to pass when Israel had made an end of slaying all the inhabitants of Ai in the field, in the wilderness, where they pursued them, and when they all had fallen by the edge of the sword until they were consumed, that all the Israelites returned to Ai and struck it with the edge of the sword. So it was that all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai. For Joshua did not draw back his hand, with which he stretched out the spear until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. Only the livestock and the spoil of that city Israel took as booty for themselves, according to the word of the Lord, which he had commanded Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and made it a heap forever, a desolation for, for, to this day. And the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until evening. Uh, and as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they take the corpse down from the tree, cast it in the entrance of the gate of the city, and rise over a great heap of stones that remain to this day. So a radical uh, move, radical victory again. And uh, there's no mention in all of the conquest of there being any defeat against the children of Israel. And I would just say that they were brutal lessons initially. But the lessons learned were learned well and that God can continue to bless his people um, you know, under, under Joshua's leadership because things changed after that, but while Joshua was leading. So now Joshua built an altar to the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. So that would be about 20, 25 mile journey to go build that um, altar so not convenient to 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 lead millions of people you know kind of pull up stakes pull up camp move millions 20 25 miles to go build an altar in obedience to the word of god not convenient for sure 
Matter of fact, very difficult for sure. Because it says, as Moses, his servant of the Lord, had commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man has wielded an iron tool, and they offered it, they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And uh, the word that initially came to Joshua, now we see him here carefully heeding what was said to him early on in the, in the initiation of his the initial orders as he was given the leadership position. We see back in Joshua 1.8, where it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. So basically not until or not instead of. Now Joshua is carefully going to say, what, Lord, what do we do next? What's next? Because when you read back in Deuteronomy chapter 11, where it's recorded, Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessings, if you obey the commandments of the Lord, your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord, your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods, which you have not known, now, it shall be when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess, that you shall put the blessings on Mount Gershom and the curse, curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not on the other side of the Jordan toward the setting sun in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in the plain opposite Gilgal beside the terebinth trees of Moray? The answer, of course, is Yes. For you will cross over the Jordan and go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and you will possess it and dwell in it, and you shall be careful to observe all the statutes and judgments which I set before you today. And so here we have a, a, a word given that Joshua is following to the detail and there, in the presence of the children of Israel, verse 32, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. Then all Israel, with their elders and officers and judges, stood on either side of the ark before the priest, the Levites who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, the stranger as well as he who was born among them. Half of them were in, in front of Mount Gershom, and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessings and the cursings, according to all that was written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded with Joshua that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel with the women, the little ones, the strangers who were living among them. And so Joshua did not skip a word of all the blessings and of all the cursings. And he read it all. And of course, that's my conviction, uh, passed on by my pastor to take the whole counsel of the word of God and not skip the, the hard things because they're hard to deal with. We know that um, the Apostle Paul had made that statement to the elders at um, Ephesus for in Acts 20, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And I, I want to be able to say that. And I think that we can say that even if our ministry is short lived, because as long as you're as long as you're faithful to say everything that God has you to say, that 
there would be the representation of those things that were a blessing and a representation of those things that would be a cursing. I mean, you don't have to say it for preaching for 50 years. You could say it being a Christian for one year. Those things that represent the truth that are shown so many times over and over in Scripture. And so there is a way to present in part and when that way is followed, it's not correct because it speaks in half-truths. And half-truths are a lie when people will say, I'm going to tell you about grace and I'm going to tell you about forgiveness and I'm going to tell you about God's blessing and I'm going to talk about love and I'm going to talk about joy and I'm going to talk about peace and I'm going to talk about everlasting life, blah, blah, blah but I'm not going to tell you about hell. I'm not going to talk about sin. I'm not going to talk about that because you may get convicted and then leave the church and go find somewhere else to fellowship where they don't hurt your feelings. You know, that kind of a thing, and it's out there a lot. Um, I've heard it. I've heard, uh, I've heard it a lot, actually. And it's a sad thing because they're going to be accountable to the Lord. But I know that when we first um, went on the radio, because the whole counsel of God is the Old Testament and the New Testament, but when we first went on the radio a few years back, uh, we started with the book of Leviticus. And, I mean, church, I mean, all Calvary chapels do and probably other, some other churches that teach all the way through the word, but that's the book that would be avoided by churches that don't teach the whole counsel of God because that deals about to sin and to be accountable for, and so many things are discussed that are very difficult things to deal with. But I just thought, let's put that on, you know, let's put that on the radio, then everybody will know where we're coming from. And so we did. Uh, but the thing is, is our goal is to get God's word out, that God's word would go forth. Because the promise we have when God's word goes forth is that in Isaiah 55, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Now, that's God's word. That's not our word that has that. Our word could be helpful, but our word is not backed by that promise. You know, we can give, you know, we can teach and, and all of that, but the promises that are given there is when God's word goes out. When God goes, God's word goes out, it could go out without any commentary and it will not return void. That's what the promise is. Now, we're hopeful that the gift of teaching that we could be of some benefit, but that's not what the promise is. The, prob the promise isn't some fancy message, that, uh, but the promise is God's word. And so that's why we do our best to get God's word out. And so once again... Uh, you've already heard this. This is the what I call the before principle. <laughs> you heard this before, and um, you know when I think about that, what are the conditions, the parameters of, you know, walking with Jesus? You know what is necessary from us to be filled and continually filled by the Holy Spirit. You've already heard this. It's obedience. It's following the Lord. It's, it's, it's you know, our desire to, to do his will, to be filled and continually filled. It's not having an eye, eye for the world, but it's having an eye for the Lord, a heart for the Lord. And then by doing so, you've already heard this. And that's how you're filled and you're continually filled with the Spirit. That's how you're going to have victory over the enemy and you're going to have you know, God working as you represent truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Amen? Amen. Amen. So read ahead, ch chapter 
nine's next, and there's an interesting chapter coming up. Uh, the treaty with the Gibeonites. <laughs> Again, this is not a defeat against Israel, but once again, Joshua could have avoided a whole lot of, of problems with uh, just coming before the Lord again and not, you know, depending on his gut feeling. So read ahead, read ahead there. So Lord, uh, you know, again, we, we thank you for your word that, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel of life and we pray Holy Spirit, once again, that your word would continue to nourish our spiritual man that you made alive and um, that you would um, increase our ability, Lord, to trust you, increase our, our faith, because we know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And so as we, we study and we see the principles in place and we know that you're unchanging and we know that we're looking at the response of, of men of faith in their humanity, and 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 yet and and yet um, um, taking great courage in moving forward, even with the the various hiccups along the way. But we want to thank you, Lord, because we know that we're we can all identify with that. So so help us to uh, just completely tap into the resources that you made available to us, Lord, that we might. Uh, we be reminded that we're fighting from a place of victory and that we've been given your promises to, to move forward and, and your promises to be fruitful. So I pray a blessing upon your people tonight. And, you know, together again, we want to lift up just all that's going on over there in Turkey and Syria and the aftermath of uh, those earthquakes. And we just want to pray for our brothers and sisters that are in the midst of all that and just ask that you would anoint them, fill them with your spirit, just uh, help them, Lord, to, to lead many to come to know you. And so uh, bless your people. Once again, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.